Hi, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. My name is Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. Good afternoon. How are you today? I hope you guys are having an awesome Sunday. And as always, thank you for um, spending the next hour with us. Yeah. And today, this is kind of the trifecta of really difficult subjects that we've it really is. covered. It really, and is. Yeah. it really has been back to back. But today, we're closing out the first half of season five, talking about researching and tracing the descendants of breeders. And right. yes, indeed. And Donnie and I had a very intense and interesting discussion for a good half an hour this morning as we were putting our show notes together and kind of going through things and realized that we, had a t we needed to have a more nuanced understanding of what the term breeder meant. And by that, I'm going to say that my understanding of that term came from reading history books. Um, that weren't, weren't written by our people, were written by other people. And I came to understand that my understanding of that term was too narrow. I always thought about breeders having kids for the purpose of those children being sold. And you know, you and I are going to talk about the conversation that we had over the next couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. And I realized that wasn't necessarily the case. It could be one right. of two things. You're either breeding children to deliberately be sold as a commodity, or you were breeding children just to have more hands do stuff. Right. I they was were enslaved. Under the, right. And I was under the impression that when I thought about breeding, I immediately thought about animals. So I thought about breeding animals and, and so on and so forth. And, um, that was my overall thought process. So I never would assume that somebody else, like my grandmother, would have been a, would have been considered um, a breeder. Well, I guess I would have assumed that for her, but no, I wouldn't have because she all of her kids were with her. So no, I wouldn't have assumed that my grandmother would have actually been considered a breeder. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. This show was hard. So the reason why we're going to spend some time going over a better understanding of what breeding is, and for those of you who are following us on Facebook and YouTube, please do ask your questions and please do give your comments, um, which we will probably read, you know, we'll read out on the show. Because this is an interesting discussion, and I, I really don't want to leave this too soon. So, but for all of you who are waiting for the big reveal about how to research the children of breeders, I'm going to preempt it now to say that rather than keep you guys hanging on, you can only do it one of two ways. And that's either going through a paper trail or DNA. There is no other way to do it. Nope. And hopefully the conversation that Donnie and I are going to have together, and hopefully that you guys are going to be involved in, is going to help us better understand how you could spot an ancestor who may have been a breeder. And then from there, work out the best route, whether it's going to be a paper trail or whether it's going to be a DNA test or DNA results, that are going to help you stitch that part of your family back together. Because right. Donnie, you and I, you and I've used both. We've both, we've used a paper trail, and we've used DNA. Exactly. And even though we've always said that Moses Williams, who had forty five kids, was not a breeder, he was. He a was. <laughs> he was a breeder. He was a breeder. Yeah. With this and, kind and this, of... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's just kind of weird that we're we're going through all of this and and realizing just today. Because it's like just today that we've realized out of all of our researching years that we've realized that breeding is more than what we what we originally thought is is there's actually levels and um doing that little half hour to an hour conversation today it was just taxing it was it was it was taxing mm -hmm. so because again, you and I are both going to share a, a more kind of immediate family. So my mother's maternal grandmother, Gertrude Harling Matthews of Edgefield, South Carolina, who was born in the 1880s, the late, the latter part of the 1880s, had she been who had 14 children? And it's weird, and it's it's really painful for me to say because I mean I had Granny Gertrude in my life until I was 14. Mm -hmm. 
So I knew her. She, she was, you know, I loved her and she was part of my life. It's hard for me to believe that if she had been born a generation previously, she would have been enslaved and she would have been considered a breeding. She would have been considered, considered what, what they called a fine breeding woman. Right. That's hard. And, and, and that's the same for me. I mean, first of all, because I'm 49, but my grandparents were born in the 1800s. They, even though it was the latter part of the 1800s, nevertheless, how many 49-year-olds are you can say that their grandparents were born in, in the 1800s? So my, my grandparents were born in 1894 and 1898. Um, and my grandmother's mother was born in 1867, which was right after everything was done. So she was born free, but she had 10 children. So my great grandmother, literally, had she been born earlier, she would have been considered a, um, a breeder. Her mother was considered a breeder. Breeder. Now, before we go deep, deep into this, I want to say Merry Christmas, because we did not. <laughs> yes, we did. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy everything. You know, um, happy New Year. And then I also wanted to share with you guys, like Brian said, this is the last half. I mean, this is the, I'm going to say the third of our show. And so we will be going on hiatus after this show until Black History Month. And our Black History Month will start. January 30th. So we will be back on January the 30th. Uh, I will be playing, we will be playing, um, what do you call them? Reruns. We will be playing reruns. Thank you. We will be <laughs> playing reruns on um, E360 TV. So if you've missed it and you have not, there were some shows that you may have missed. Not only can you look at videos from Facebook or look at videos from YouTube on demand, you can also catch them on E360 TV. So make sure you do that. I just wanted to let you know that now. So I'm going to try to stitch three things together. It's a book called The American Slave Coast, and I'm going to um, post a, a link to this book. So it's a relatively new book. It's called The American Slave Coast, A History of the Slave Breeding Industry, and is written by a couple called Ned and Constance Sublet. And the perfect storm is that 1808 embargo against the importation of enslaved Africans into this country. And there was a reason for that. And there was a reason why the, the slaveholding states in 1808 actually joined up with the new Inc the non-enslaving states to pass this legislation. So it's 1808, there were already hundreds of thousands of enslaved people already here in the United States who were being bred to produce children to either work, to remain within this enslaving family, to either work, or to be sold. And obviously, if you're thinking about everything comes back to money, Everything about our enslaved ancestry always comes back to money. And I think that's, I'm rewiring my brain to kind of look at our genealogy through that lens from now on. So in 1808, the Southern, and it's all in this book, the Southern slaveholders were afraid that if more Africans were being introduced into America, it was lowering the price that could be fetched for an enslaved person at auction. So importing more was diluting the value. They didn't want that because their value, and I'm going to read these numbers to you in a minute because they are mind-blowing. The amount of money that people who are already enslaved here were generating just through their value alone dwarfed everything. Yeah. So again, this is coming from, um, so it was saying as as long as the slave power continued to grow, breeders could literally bank on future demand and increasing prices. That made slaves not just a commodity, but the closest thing to money that white breeders had. It's hard to quant quantify just how valuable people were as commodities, but the sublets, the authors of this book, try their best to convey it. By a conservative estimate in 1860, the total value of American slaves was four 
billion dollars. Not million, billion with a B. Far more than gold and silver then circulate, circulating within the nation. And they've estimated that to be about 228 million. Most of it concentrated in the North. That was the gold and the silver. The authors then add the total amount of currency circulating in the United States in 1860 was 435 million. And even the value of the South's total farmland, 1.92 billion. So the amount, the value of slaves, 4 billion, four times more than the value of all the available land in the South. I mean, that, that, was, the, that was the bit that just kind of blew me away. I mean, it's a lot. It's, it's, it, you, that's when you realize, should I say this? Okay. <laughs> That's when you realize the number of people that were here and how many of them were here. Um it's it's an amazing number, but the thing is is that a lot of them were all were born, you know, here. It, you know, it's 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 just an it's an I mean, I'm gonna tell y'all right now, I'm I'm in I'm emotional already so and it's it's a lot to to take in to understand to to know it's very personal for me because I actually have a great grandmother who is considered um a breeder because of her cost so it's just I I don't know I'm I'm just I'm at a loss because again, we had to go back into our tree with because you know we have done extensive research on our state slaved family, taking some many of those lines back into the 1700s, and I think our whole team kind of felt confident that even though we know that we didn't, we haven't found all of the children for all of the enslaved couples, we felt that we had a reasonable number of them. Yes. And now I'm beginning to challenge myself: Do we? Yes. Yes. Do we? Right, because you you don't you actually don't know you can't like for example I'm gonna go into my example as far as Martha is concerned. Um, Martha Brooks, she is my great grandmother is considered a breeder because of the amount that she was. Um, she was my you could find her in the book by herself at one thousand two hundred and five dollars. She you know being sold for that amount of money is is a big deal and um it's just it doesn't when i look at it and i and i look at what she had i started to say well wait a minute was she really a breeder because i know who all her children I, I so far i have all of her children but now with the stuff that we've learned <laughs> you know, it's just like I don't know. She may not, it, and then not to mention the fact that my mom has these connections to these people, and I have no idea why it has everything to do with breeding. So yeah, I think she was a breeder, but it could be somebody else. So I'm just literally not sure. It's so it, it's it. You know, this whole thing. So let me let me say. What we've learned, like Brian said, what we've learned is that it actually did not matter what type of breeder you were, what type of breeder you were, whether mm -hmm. you were someone whose child was sold, taken from you and sold, or you were just having kids to take care of that farm. Now, everybody, everybody would say that most genealogical researchers, genealogists, they say, yeah, my, the, at some point my family was having children just to help with the farm. Guess what, y'all? That was breeding. They actually consider that breeding. And we learned that. What was the name of the, the book, Brian, that we learned that from? I'm going to have to take a look at the, the, it's on Messenger. I know I sent it to you on Messenger. I'll yeah. have to look at it. While you're looking for that, I just want to quickly address something that a view, that a guest the audience member has said, uh, Carla Coleman. Um, Carla, Sally Hemings was not a breeder. Um, in order to be a breeder, you have to have a certain amount, of, at least a certain amount of children born 
consistently. Thomas Jefferson absolutely did not sell any of those Hemings kids. He didn't sell a single one of them. So I just, I just needed to, and this is my family, so I, I know it. So I, I just wanted to set that straight. Well, the name of, well, we're, we are sitting here telling them that you don't have to sell your children to be breeders, but I do understand what it is that you're saying this out because she, she was not a breeder. No. Um, but the name of the book that we learned this from was called The Breeding of American Slaves. And we will put these, these comments, we will put these links in your book. And this particular book is free on Kindle Unlimited. So if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can get this for free. And basically this book is true stories um, that were taken from the American slave narrative. Now, I don't know if y'all know about me. Um, I'm not a big fan of the slave narratives because I learned from one person who who is possibly in my family that when she was doing her research, she ended up finding the slave narrative from her grand, from one of her um, ancestors. I don't know if he was a great grandfather, great great, or something to that nature. But she uh, she had gone to her family and she asked them, you know, you guys knew I was researching. Why didn't you tell me about this? They didn't tell her about it because they were ashamed of it, and they weren't ashamed of it because of him. They were ashamed of it because he didn't speak the way they had him that they had his narrative written it was in that old slave yasm type dialect and he didn't speak that way he actually spoke just like we're talking right now and then when we read the other book um the house of bondage those were enslaved people that she those were ex enslaved people that she was speaking to freshly ex enslaved people. I mean, the book was written in 1890, but it was put out in 1890. She actually did everything well before, earlier before, and they didn't speak like that. So I do have an issue with the slave narrative book. However, these people told their stories, whether it was whether they spoke that way or not. They told their stories and the stories that they told were were just unbelievable. There was one about um, a guy named Luke Blackshear, and he he was considered a stock. And that's another question that Brian and I were wondering: were they always called stud or were they called stock? Well, this said a stock Negro, and when they talked about him, they talk. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let me just tell y'all: the man was a a beast. Because he could do everything from mechanic work, build, um, make shoes, build houses, anything. Anything you put in front of him, he could do it. But yet this man had was known to father 56 children and was called the giant breeder. He was known as the giant breeder. Now, for me, a breeder was someone who just did not know their kids. So. They're not saying that he knew all of his kids, right, Brian? That was my impression. Yeah, they're not saying that he knew all his children. Um, and they they literally said in here, he was bought and given to his young mistress in the same way you would give a mule or coat to a child. So those, you know, it's those types of things that you're looking at when you're reading in this book that you actually start seeing. And they and they just talked about everything he did, how he passed on all of his knowledge to his um how he passed on all of his knowledge to his children, his son, and and everything. And it's just an amazing it's an amazing it's an amazing story. But this man was considered a breeder. But then when you go a little bit further, you see one and they talk about it. And the woman had 20 some odd children. And this lets you know that she knew her kids. And they were some of them were actually in that book. They were specifically using the word breeder. They specifically right. used that. And that, these were the enslaved people themselves talking about their mother, their grandmother, their great grandmother. If I can find the link, I'm looking for the link now to post it in the chat. 
Because again, in terms of genealogical value, because these people are naming their mothers, their grandmothers, their fathers, their grandfathers, it's again, it's it's one of those go golden nuggets that we that we stumbled across. Right. But you you know, because we were talking, we were actually sharing the stories as we were finding them, and you know, people were saying that either me or my grandmother or my great grandmother were you know were having twelve kids, sixteen kids, twenty kids. One of the women said that she had had thirty kids. And I didn't get the impression that some of them they were very you know they were they were very transparent in terms of how many were sold, but I remember the woman that had said that she'd had thirty. I don't think any of her children were sold. Right. If they were, she didn't say. She, she didn't, didn't give that. She didn't give that impression. She didn't. She did not. She did not. And it's just amazing how that's when we started to learn just looking at these slave narratives that breeding wasn't just left to those who were being sold. It was actually everybody. So can you imagine, look at your own self, look at the stuff that you know about your family. And if you have someone down the line who just had a 10 or more kids, they would have been thought of, They, but still children wouldn't kept, they would have been thought of as breeders. Like it's, it's an amazing, it's, it's amazing. And you actually gave, <clears throat> so this is, Tip number one, and you, Donya actually gave it. One of the ways that you can determine whether your ancestor was a breeder, both male or male or female, is their valuation. Right. The actual value. <clears throat> right. Now, if you're looking in an enslaver's will or a probate record or a deed that they did with if they were selling someone, they may act, they may not use the word breeder. What was the word? Sometimes they did. There is a term, likely. Likely was one of those clues. Um, but you can also see things like prime wench, likely wench, prime, be prime breeding wench. I mean, I know that these are all horrible terms and they're all horrible words, but these are the, if you're going to do this kind of research, these are the terms you have to get familiar with. Can't really get, can't really get emotional about it. And you have a better memory than I do on this particular subject. What were breeding women going for? What was their average kind of valuation? I knew it was way over a thousand dollars. Oh, I can I can definitely tell you because I had to write about it with Martha. Um, so the thing about it, Martha Brooks. Let me let me. If you go to something else, I'll pull it up, and then I mm -hmm. can definitely let y'all know exactly what it was. Um, two of the other ways is if you're looking at the 1850 or the 1860 slave schedule, if you're looking at a list of enslaved people and you're seeing mostly, I'm going to say, younger women, like seven, 16, 17, 18, going into 20, up to about 25, if that population, if the enslaved population is mostly women of childbearing age with a lot of kids and only a couple of men, that's something that should start raising a red flag with you. Right. Now, I know from our own family, you know, human biology 101, the human species always produces more females than males. It is what it is. So you always kind of have to factor that in. Um, but if you're looking at an enslaved population, which is kind of artificially created um, by the enslaver, that's kind of one flag. If I'm seeing a lot of women of childbearing age, a lot of kids, not many men, that raises a red flag for me. <clears throat> that requires a lot more, a lot more research, and that's going into the enslaver's deed records, ledger books if I can find them. Um, other business records, probate records, estate inventories, that kind of a thing. The other thing that raises a flag for me is, again, same scenario, but if most of the women were Black, there could even be some, some mulatto women in there, but most of the children are mulatto. Well, that didn't happen by accident. And right. Again, it's all about, because we just get so excited when we find records, and it's, it's a genealogy thing. It, it's inbuilt in us to get excited when we find things. And I have a bad habit for this as much as anyone else. Sometimes I will focus so much on the person that I'm 
looking at or looking for in a record, I forget to take a couple of steps back and look at the whole record <laughs> to try to understand what it's telling me. Yeah. And and that's that that I mean that was my whole dilemma as a researcher from the beginning. I always I just made myself take that whole step back and I would all just try to you know disconnect myself from it. And I'm telling you guys this lady Martha Brooks she was like no ma'am no you will not you will not disconnect yourself you will not go and act like everything that I went through wasn't important. And it wasn't like I it, it it wasn't like that I was acting like that. It's just that I didn't want to be hurt. So in order for me not to be hurt, I had to disconnect. But unfortunately, you got to be hurt by it in order for you to really tell the story the way it's supposed to be told. So Brian asked me about the the amount and the money. This is a 18 this is a chart. I okay, so what I'm reading from is my book. And um, I said, I did a search and found a chart explaining the worth of a slave during 1857, which was the same year that my great grandmother was sold. Um, this chart compared the cost of a slave in 1857 to what a slave would cost if slavery still existed in 1998. So for, for, the best girls, which were probably young teenage girls, 13 or whatever the case may be, they were worth 500 to a thousand dollars. Let me put my glasses on. Why am I faking? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Um, so it was 500 to a thousand dollars in 1857, but in, in 1998, she would have been worth 8,300 dollars to sixteen thousand seven hundred dollars fair to ordinary women were worth and number one women both of them they were worth one thousand fifty dollars to one thousand two hundred twenty five dollars so their costs in in 1998 would have been anywhere from fourteen thousand two hundred dollars and 17 to seventeen thousand one hundred or $17,500 to $20,400. And then you had the boys ages, ages 10 to 14, and they broke them up. Ages 10 to 14 were worth 500 to 575, and 15 to 18 were worth 1100 to $1,200. In 1998, the 500 to 575 was 8300 to 17900 the eleven hundred to twelve hundred dollars, which was ages fifteen to eighteen, were eighteen thousand three hundred to twenty thousand. But then you had your fair or ordinary men who were worth one thousand dollars to eleven fifty in eighteen fifty seven. In nineteen ninety eight, they would have been worth sixteen thousand seven hundred to nineteen thousand two hundred. And your number one man in eighteen fifty seven would have been worth twelve hundred fifty dollars to fourteen hundred fifty dollars. In 1998, he would have been worth $20,800 to $24,100. So learning that my great-grandmother was, um, when she was sold, she was sold for $1,205. That placed her in the number one woman slot. It also made her more than a fair or ordinary man as well. So those are the things that you, you know, that's why I took myself out of it. I didn't need to feel that stuff. <laughs> I didn't want to know any of those things. So, yeah, that, you know, that's what that means. And then the reason why I have this in my book is because I was told by someone that she may not have been one. So just to, just to give you all a short excerpt, um, there was a slave, I went and I did my research and there was the opinions of Fogel and Ingerman. They just didn't believe that breeding existed. And um, they said, they went to, I went, I ended up going into the slave narratives, WPA slave narratives of 1930s and a former slave by the name of Richard Max enslaved in Merlin and interviewed in 1937 said this. One time they sent me 
on Old Mac Williams Farm here in Jasper County, Georgia. That man will kill you show. If that little brat branch on his plantation could talk, it would tell many a tale about folks being knocked in the head. I done seen Mac Williams kill folks and I done seen him have folks killed. One day he told me that if my wife had been good looking, I never would have slept sleep with her again. Because he'd kill me and take her and raise chillings off of her. Then he said they used to take women away from, they used to, I'm trying to read it like he said, like the way they said it, but it's very difficult. They used to take women away from their husbands and put with some other man to breed just like they would do cattle. They always kept the man pinned up and they used them like, use them like a stud horse yeah okay so go ahead brian because i'm done <laughs> well i was gonna ask if you wouldn't mind reading the thing about the 13 to 17 year olds what on where? that was out of that the kindle book Oh, I gotta find. Okay, well, um, you know, they they would say on a Sunday the the Sunday barn thing, um, because again oh, yeah, the reason Mr. Polk that was Doctor Polk, wasn't it? Mm hmm. I wish I'd written the page number down, um, because again, while we're having this discussion, this is America. This is the United States. Always have to remind myself the country that I'm that I'm living in, because there is a debate. Um, we're going to probably share some screen grabs in a minute of a thread on Quora um, where people can ask questions and then people provide answers. And someone asked the question, were, you know, was breeding a thing in America? And you have historians who've written books up there saying, no, it didn't happen. They were never bred like they were animals. Well, you just heard Donya read an excerpt, first-hand account. From, an, uh, from a freedman using the term cattle. Right. They were being bred like cattle. And they you're going to hear a story. Like and you're going to hear a story shortly that, again, proves the same thing. Um, so, again, as we're going through this conversation, you're probably beginning to get a sense that the paper trail isn't impossible, it's just very difficult. Like I said, um, those of you who've been following the whole Moses Williams story, you know that he had 45 kids. We found 27 of them. He had 40 girls, five boys. Found all the boys, about half of the girls. Um, they were all born enslaved, all born during the slavery period. And that's what's been so difficult about finding the rest of his daughters. Is again, by the time they would have appeared in the 1870 census, they would be there under their married names. They would not be there under the name Williams. And really, for the last half of his daughters, the only the only way we can find them is through DNA. And am I right in thinking, Donya, that we did actually find about 10 of those girls through surprise DNA results? Oh, most definitely. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And I found the story. And again, it was the black, sh it was the, the, um, it was Ida black, the black shear family. So here it is. It said once on the black shear place, they took all the fine looking boys and girls that was 13 years old or older and put them in a big barn after they had stripped them naked. They used to strip them naked and put them in a big barn every Sunday, Lord's day and leave them there until Monday morning. Out of that came 60 babies. Am I reading this whole thing? You want me to read I this think, whole thing? Uh, if, if you want to. I mean, I okay. think that I think that kind of that kind of did it. Well, I, I want I do want to read another part of it. Mm -hmm. um, there was too many babies to leave in the quarters for someone to take care of during the day when the young mothers went to work. Blackshear had them take their babies with them to the field, and it was two or three miles from the house to the field. He didn't want them to lose time walking back and forth with nursing. They built a long old trough, trough like a great long cradle and put all these babies in it every morning. When the mother come out to the field, it was set at the end of the rows under a big old cottonwood tree. Uh, then it goes on. So that means that they were there, that you could feed, you know, they could nurse their children and still go back to work or whatever, and, and the case may be. 
So one day when it got so they could go to the other end of the field, the trough was filled. Oh, wait. When they were at the other end of the row, all at once, a cloud no bigger than a small spot came up and it grew fast and it thundered and lightened as if the world were coming to an end and the rain just came down in great sheets. And when it got so they could go to the other end of the field, that trough was filled with water and every baby in it was floating around the water, drowned. They never got nary a lick of labor, nary a red penny for nary one of those, them babies. First of all, who gives a crap about how much money they should have gotten for those babies when they wouldn't even let that, those women go and save their children? Let's, let's, let's let that sit and marinate. Because I, 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 I'm like, I, I don't care. I don't care how much money he didn't make. I don't care what he, you know, I don't care. So, yeah. But, and the other side of that is the horrible story that I relate to you. And again, DNA is the only thing that could ever solve this one. There was an enslaver, I'm not going to say who he is, and I don't even remember what state it was in. Um, he had the habit of putting bags over the head of the breeding pair because he did not want them to see who they were making or potentially making children by. And the reason why he did that was because he didn't care who he made it them with. And I will find it to put the link in so people know that I'm not making this up. I mean, you can't he would have he, he would have them having sex with a parent, an aunt or an uncle, a niece or a nephew, a cousin. He didn't care who it was. All he wanted was a baby at the end of it. Um, plus, his kind of friends and family, not anyone could have a go, because all he wanted was kids. And he, wasn't, and he wasn't even selling them. He just wanted more hands working on his property. So you can imagine even the woman didn't know who the father of her children was, because right. she had a bag over her head. DNA is the only thing that could solve that. Right. I mean, it, it's it's all overwhelming, and 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 when you look at these different stories, and you and you talk about these different stories, and and it's just all overwhelming. I am to the point where, um, I know I know what I have to do as far as doing these. But now learning this whole new thing that breeding is, it's everybody. Maybe again, that's why he's, maybe that's why the people actually made that comment that breeding didn't exist. That could be why they made, true. yeah. That this could be true. why they made that comment. But I'm going to have to go back over all of those old estate inventories that I have. Because before we went live, one of the things I did is I pulled up the valuation that Ned Harling was given in 1857. And I compared that to the valuation of Moses Williams in the last estate inventory that we have where he was on it. And I think that was 1830. It was like either 1830 or 1840 for Moses. Moses was worth three times more. Even though they were comparatively the same age, Moses was worth three times more because over his ad, I think Ned, by the time he was 35, had only produced five kids. Moses, by the time he was 35, had produced a hell of a lot more than just Probably 20. <laughs> Probably 20. Probably 20. And it's reflected in their valuation. Like I said, Moses is literally, was literally worth three times more than Ned. And I so begin to understand. Kids, so even if Moses' kids were not sold, and even if Moses does know his children, they still worked that farm. Oh, absolutely. They still did. They still mm -hmm. did what they were supposed to do. So with that being said, I mean, why could he not be? Could he not have been a breeder? He was just a breeder who got to keep his kids. And, and, and that could be what my Martha was a breeder to keep. I guess it throws things off because now that chart that I just read out, in a way, it doesn't matter whether you were someone that was just set to have children 
or not unless you were sold to a breeding farm. And That's when the matter came in. And what do you what is your thought about this? Because I spotted it with Jane, um, Peter Peterson's wife, Jane Williams. Violet. Her doc, Violet, sorry, Violet. I've got Jane on the brain for some reason today. Violet mm -hmm. Williams. Now, there is something up with her because I can't remember how much she was valued for, but it was over way over $1,000. But when you look at the number of known children that they had, she's kind of on that cusp. They had a lot of kids, but I don't think we're quite at the double digits for them. I think we only have eight or nine. I'm beginning to think that we need to find more kids for them because for her to have the valuation that she had now is telling me that she was considered a breeder. So oh, I think you, there's you more. You haven't talked to Loretta, have you? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. You need we'll to save that. We'll save that conversation for after the show. Because I think Loretta said that she actually that Loretta might have found um a couple of more kids for Violet. Well, that would make sense. So that's something else that I would advise our audience to do is if you do have a valuation for an enslaved ancestor, um, especially from um, an auction or an estate sale or an estate valuation, really take a look at that number. Donga, you got those figures from, I'll have, I'll, even I'll take a look in your book because you, you source it. You source where you got those, those numbers that from. Chart? To put That chart, to put a yeah. link to that also in the chat because I'm telling you, everyone who hasn't really thought about this before needs to go back to those documents and look at really look at how much your enslaved answer, ancestor was valued at the age in which they were they had that value associated with them and then look at the number of known children the ones that you've absolutely proven have been their children you may need to find more kids or really go back into your dna test results if you've taken a dna test look at your DNA matches and really start digging into them. Um, Cause I'm going to make that a project for myself in, um, in the early part of 2022. Cause again, it's a habit of, it's a habit. We go into our DNA results. We take a look at who we're matching. I don't know that surname. I don't know that surname. I don't know how we're related. If, your family has a history of producing kids on a regular basis, and a lot of them um, need to try to figure out if perhaps the person you're looking at is a descendant of a child that was given away, sold, bequeathed, and then taken elsewhere, or product of, I guess, you know, what we would consider, you know, what we would call breeding. Exactly. Um, I'm trying to pull that up for you guys and put it in your thing. And what's what what's really great about this? Well, not great, but it's not. It's, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's actually it was through the South Carolina Information, as they call it, highway. Mm -hmm. It was through. So it was definitely through um, through there that I found this stuff. And um, they have a lot. Here it is. Here it is, right here. Because that's a very that that was has proven to be a very useful kind of guide to it look was. at. Because because um, I do when I come across an inventory, I do pull that up to it to was. reference it. It was that was a very it, it, yeah. It was that particular when I looked at when you guys look at that particular link. It, it you you're gonna because not only does that link talk about it has that particular um chart that I was reading off to you guys and everything. It also has another chart where you start to see the value of people going down. So at age one, you're a hundred dollars right at age one and it goes up until you're 20 and at 20 you're not going to be less than 900 but then after 20 it begins to drop again and it starts 21 875 22 850 23 everything goes down by 25 dollars so that by the time you're 60 years old you're worth about a fit about 50 dollars mm -hmm. That th this thing is it is so um that was it was mm -hmm. yeah 
So Terry Bradshaw Pierre has asked an awesome and an excellent question. This really is an excellent question, Terry, and, and thank you for asking it. Is there a certain time period breeding occurred? My honest answer is I don't know when it kind of officially became a thing, but in that slavery as it is book, around it's the pages between 182 to 186 specifically deal with breeding and breeding in Virginia. Um, how do I want to put this? In 1839, there's slightly conflicting reports, but in 1839, it's being said that Virginia, on its own, exported between 40,000 people to 60,000 enslaved people in one year. Every year. That's yeah. how many people were leaving Virginia, going down to the, the deep south. So, of, so apparently by 1739, at least, it's a thing. And if it's that much of a thing that is being debated within Congress and, na na well, the then national United States of America, that means they've been in practice for a while. It, well, it was a new. Yeah, according to... Um, so when you when you sent me that that link as it is, they talked about when the abolishing of the transatlantic slave trade finally took effect, and that took the, took effect in January 1, 1808. And it says that the story behind this ban begins at the Constitutional Convention of 1787, when slavery lurked beneath several debates and figured in several compromises compromises fashioned to win the support of Southern delegates for the Constitution. One such compromise was a constitutional clause preventing Congress from banning the importation of slaves from Africa for 20 years. So apparently after the 20 years was up. And that's why it was now time to stop it. So it had been going on. It, it was, you know, they knew they would have enough after that. It's it's almost like, you know, I I I'm I'm an American, y'all, and I and I and I love America regardless of its ups downs and terrible ways that they are right now. It's well, especially right now. So, but my thing is, is that those forefathers, they knew a lot. They 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 thought about a lot before it even happened. You know, when you think about the things with Trump, when you think about just all of the different things that are going on, they kind of set a precedent already in the constitution of what should happen if this should occur. And I, at this point, I am not going to not believe that they didn't know that within that 20 year period, they would have enough enslaved people here to start breeding on their own. Which brings me to the sublet book again, because this was a shocker. We always talk about the three-fifths compromise. I never realized how complicated that was in some of the underlying reasons mm -hmm. behind it and why the mm -hmm. South fought for that so hard. So keep in mind what you just said. They, again, in the American political fashion, they tried to punt the football down the, the yard lines by 20 years. Yeah, we'll let someone else deal with this. You know, we're we're going to do this stopgap, and then we'll let, let's let's circle around to this in, in twenty years' time to to pick up the ball. Three fifths compromise. So by banning the importation of Africans, by supporting the breeding of the enslaved population already here, and increasing that size, even at th being three fifths of a represented human being, those numbers of that resulted from breeding enabled the South to return more senators mm -hmm. and more representatives to Congress yeah, to have an out to have an outsized influence in yeah. government. Yeah. Because if it had been straight up just white, you know, you can only have a representative based on the number of white men, white landowning men, because let's not forget a lot of poor whites didn't own land. That was the first construct to be able to vote. So again, we're talking about white male landowners the South wouldn't have had anywhere near the number of representatives and they senators if they it had been not. based just on that. That's right. Now, Yolanda Robinson kind of answered 
tried to answer that question and her her answer is actually a very good one she said my guess is breeding follows the agricultural season you don't want to inhibit women having a baby and not available to work in the field i, I that sounds good but when you're reading this american breeding you don't get that because he said they, mm. it didn't matter. It didn't matter to them whether they were pregnant or not. I mean, the, there was one where the lady was real happy. Dr. Polk, that was the one that was Dr. Polk. She said mm -hmm. that Dr. Polk and his son were two mean men and her mother beat him up and made him cry. That's what she said in the thing. Her mother beat him up, but they were so mean. And I know you guys have heard this before because I've heard it where they said that they put a hole in the ground, put the woman who was pregnant, her stomach in the hole and then whipped her. This person said that actual slave narrative, actual. Now, this woman was so mad. She said, I'm she said that man, if he came right now, she'd whoop his tail. In so many words, that's what she said. She was like, he don't need to come around me now. Now, mind you, these are slave narratives, and they were done in the 30s. She talking about something that happened, you know, way before then. And she's and still saying that that left a mark on me. That's what she said. Mm -hmm. That left a mark on me. It never went away when she saw this woman with her stomach in, in the hole, and they still beat her. And the other book I would recommend, and it's free to download on the Genealogy Adventures Reading Room, Fanny Campbell's Life on a Georgia Plantation. Because she's specific, you know, this is the wife, the English wife of an enslaver who was horrified at that pregnant enslaved women on her plants, her husband's plantation were literally almost working until the day that they dropped. And if they didn't get off that birth bed out of the, the slave hospital quick enough, after giving birth, there was no six months being with the baby. There wasn't even a week. If your butt wasn't off that mattress and back working, you were whipped. It's in that book. And it was more than one young enslaved woman that had that happen to her in that book. Well, so, maybe we need to make that book a um, book club. We did already. Oh, we did. Oh, yeah, we did. That's right. We did. I <laughs> forgot. I forgot. <laughs> I know we've done we've we've covered so many books. Yeah, we've covered a lot. I forgot. I forgot. So can you believe it's the time? It's 53. Mm -hmm. we, we're we're like almost <laughs> we're like almost this hour is almost yeah. gone. Um so you can go, Brenda Gale and uh Carla, you can go to our um website and go into our reading room. And the book will be there. Um, it's the Fanny Kimball book, Life on the life, Georgia Plantation. Yep, Life on a Georgia Plantation. Life on a Georgia Plantation. So you'll be able to find it right in our reading room. Um, but for, I'm going to say for most of us, because a lot, a lot of our audience, you know, they've been researching for, for a while. Um, my advice, and I'm taking my own advice, is go back over all of your old documents that you've gathered over the years. It's, like I said, especially those inventories, really pay attention to the words that are used to describe the people that are on that estate inventory or the probate records or a sales deed. Language back then was really important. Um, and I, you use one of the words as well, bet, was it a best girl, best boy, best girl. Research that term because that also is a very loaded term and look at the valuation. Um, get a sense of how many children your enslaved ancestors, again, the children that you know 100% were there, is there, they are documented and proven. Look at the number of children that they had, go back to those valuations and then ask yourself, am I missing children? What is the likelihood that I'm missing children? Now, I wish I could say that DNA, you could wave a magic wand and it's going to be really easy to find. But again, if these kids were separated from their parents really young, they won't know what their family name was. They're just right. going to use whatever name they're going to come up with. Right. So like anything else, um, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of due diligence, um, but mostly patience to um, 
to try to work through try to work through these DNA matches. Yeah, Mart Stephanie um, asked a good question. This may be a show we might want to do. I don't know. Do you ever touch on buck breaking? No, we have not. But we do everything else. <laughs> mm. Well, I, mean, I guess we haven't really covered buck breaking. I mean, I know we've covered parts of Black history, and I don't know why we haven't done that. Um, even though it may not sound readily apparent, there's still genealogical information in this because we are talking about there were kids that were the product of these unions. I don't even know what to call them. Right. Because um, I, I don't even want to call them pairings. Um, right. Of this. Right. Of this, of this system. Right. And then, then Tony Grant made the comment, how much of the breeding was used to supply the fancy trade? So I don't... When I did my research, um, fancy trade was included in it. Mm. So if it was included, the fancy trade was included. So if it was included in it, it was probably right right next to it. That you know they probably just did that, and you know. Yeah, but in terms of percentages, I have I have no clue. Right. But when I read about breeding, I do read about the fancy trade being one of the outlets. Yeah, it's like one in the same. It's you know. It's like one and the same. So, um, Sandra uh, Abram asks, "What is buck breaking?" Yeah, I'm. Go ahead, Brian. I I, I don't have a, the emotional. Yeah, to to, to keep that. this to keep this family friendly, it was a way of either subduing, breaking the spirit of of enslaved men. It involved the public raping of enslaved men, usually in front of their partner or family. Um, but the the raping of enslaved men, it was a thing. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was a thing. And Fancy trade is prostitution. prostitution. It's just yeah. so if you see things like sporting girl, sporting woman, fancy trade, it's prostitution. Yep, that's what that was. And if you ever gone to the um to the the to the 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 Smithsonian, there's this whole big wall on on the bottom level. And on that wall, that wall is listing all of the different people who were enslaved and how much they were, just all their names and numbers and families and, and things of that nature. And it it is the most powerful wall I've ever seen. So um, you need to go and, and see that, definitely. So guys, we love you and... Um, but we're going to take a break. And after these past three shows, I think we need it. <laughs> um, we will be back January 30th, starting our Black History Month. And we're going to start it off so strong. And we'll give you all that. And you, I mean, we'll, can we tell them the first show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Guess who we have? We have the grandson of Henrietta Lacks on our show. That is going to be the first show. If you don't know who Henrietta Lacks is, I'm going to ask you to Google her. But she is literally the reason why there is so much in um, cancer research. It's because of her. And we have her grandson on the show. Um, and for those of you who are new to following geneolo sorry, genealogy adventures, um, tip traditionally, February is our Black History Month, and we, we explore aspects and people that aren't readily talked about or acknowledged or discussed, and followed in, Feb uh, sorry, followed in March by Women's History Month. And again, we try to do the same thing. We, we try to find the people, the, the names, and the, the heroines who um kind of been ignored by history or, or overlooked. And, and the reason for that is because of the fact that, you know, um, we're tired. Okay, I don't want to say tired. Let me let me catch myself. There was more than just twelve magical Negroes. Just, that's right. There was more than Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman. There were more than there was more of us, and their stories need to be told too. Mm -hmm. So, so and so we return at the end of January. Um, I'm wishing you, and I know Dong is going to wish you a very happy New Year. Let's. I, tw let's just hope 2022 is just better. Amen. <laughs> That's all I've got to say about that. Amen. Bye, guys. <laughs> See you. <laughs>